And good morning, Lisa. How are you today? I'm doing well, uh, Michael. Thank you so much. Good morning. So we caught you and um, and and cameraman Mike, we'll call him, <laughs> out on the ice this morning. Uh, you're up in uh, in Lac La Biche, um, doing a little bit of ice fishing. Um, how how has been the fishing up in Lac La Biche this season? Well, for me, it's been really great. Uh, we've had a lot of success both with walleye and pike, um, and even seeing uh, some whitefish on the camera, which I've never targeted before, but at least we're seeing them. So that's kind of neat for me. But yeah, it's been some pretty good fishing. So you obviously, I mean, uh, you live up in that area, you know the lake ex extremely well. So a fairly, I'm assuming fairly easy for you to kind of figure out where you need to be on the lake. But for someone that's maybe never fished it before um, or a uh, fished, any open water, hard water, how, how do you go about sort of finding the, the spots? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's a good idea to start with um, using a few different kinds of apps, like whether it be Navionics or some app that you're familiar with um, that kind of shows you the depths of the lake. And for us, I, I find that um, the way we've set up today is about 30 yards north, northeast of us, you know, we're, we're sitting in that 40 feet of water. And then about 30, 40 yards south of us is about six feet of water. And I'm kind of in the middle. And I just have found that finding that kind of structure under the water is really, really important for catching walleye, especially um, in January. It's, it's always been, for me, one of the harder months to catch fish. So number one, uh, find an app or, or um, Alberta's Angler Atlas. I know they even have uh, Lac La Biche Lake in there is, uh, with some depths on it. Um, so finding depth, finding structure, and you want to definitely look for those nice ledges where, you know, it comes from, you know, 40 feet and uh, sorry, it comes from 40 feet and comes up to like 20 and 16 and so on. Uh, usually that's where I'm fishing for uh, walleye is in that 16 to 19 foot range. So uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the setup that you have once you've uh, drilled the hole and, and uh, set up the chair and you, you look like you're quite comfortable in the tent. Uh, I can see your breath. So I'm, I'm assuming you don't have a big heater in there. Uh, not a big heater. Sorry, I just got excited. I saw a fish on the camera. Um, <laughs> Not a big heater, but enough just to take the chill off. And, um, and you, you know, so with regards to my setup, I've set up the, um, the ice fishing tent and I pre-drill the holes in the tent. I, I do like my auger, my Jiffy auger, <laughs> because it's electric and it doesn't have any fumes, which is so important when you're drilling inside of a tent. And so drill my holes. I like to make my live well. I think it's really, really important when you're trying to keep the fish uh, wet and you're, you know, working with fish, especially in the winter because they don't have eyelids. And so, you know, you want to protect the fish. You want to keep them in the water as much as you can. I find the live well allows me the opportunity to take the hook out of the fish, even in the water. Hands get a little cold, but um, safety of the fish is important. So, and then I like to be um, definitely prepared when I'm ice fishing. Um, so I uh, have my rod set up. It's kind of like a uh, fish and go. So if I see a big pike come in, I can quickly grab another rod and, uh, and I'm ready to go. Same thing with, um, you know, just being prepared, having your pliers, having your jaw spreaders. Jaw spreaders, um, for me, I use in the winter time because I find that I'm not only fishing in, um, with the walleye, but there's a lot of pike in my area as well. And in the winter, for some reason, their jaws just clamp right up. I don't have that problem in the summer, but in the winter, I find that the jaw spreaders do help a little bit. And um, yeah, just being prepared, have your measuring stick, have everything ready to go so that again, you're making sure that the priority is on the fish and proper release so that it has the best chance of survival. And in terms of, uh, I guess the, the, yeah, it looks like you might have a, a visitor. <laughs> they do, but you can hardly see him right now the way I've, I've done my display settings. So he's kind of in the dark. He'll come up in the, in the brighter green and then he goes back into the dark. So 
my apologies that I keep looking over. <laughs> no, that does, that's one. I guess that's the question. I mean, uh, you can take it so far in terms of with new technology and in in your opinion does that add a, a, a another element to rather than just staring at, through an, a hole and watching water freeze you you can <laughs> at least see what's happening below you can and and you know some people don't agree with the fishing camera but i think it's a it's a great uh tool to have especially if you are introducing someone new into fishing or you're bringing kids, you know, that it's an, it's another tool to let them enjoy fishing longer. Um, even if the fish aren't biting, but they're coming in, like they kind of have been the last couple mornings, it's exciting. You still get to see it. And, and I've learned so much about uh, fish, fish behavior, uh, eating patterns, all based on this camera. Lisa, you've done so much work um, in engaging other women to mm -hmm. to get uh, on their on their own to go out and enjoy activities like this. Is ice fishing one of those activities that you feel um, um, a, a woman can can just say, "Hey, I'm heading out. I'm doing this on my own without really any any serious issues uh, surrounding uh, safety or um, just the physicality of of doing doing the work." I do believe that women can do this. I do it a lot. Now, having said that, I know they say you should always have someone with you. That's not always the case, right? Not everybody's off at the same time you are. Um, so, you know, definitely have a plan. So make sure you let someone know, first of all, where you're going on the lake, you know, whether it's, um, again, using your apps, you can uh, screenshot a picture, kind of mark your area, let someone know if you're going to move from that area. Again, let someone know. But yes, I totally think um, there's a lot that you can do on your own as a woman out here ice fishing, um, whether it be setting up your own tent, you know, drilling your own holes, all of it. I mean, it's great. It's such an awesome experience. And, and uh, I just find it so enjoyable and so grounding. Are, are you seeing more women take it on? I, yes. Like as far as social media goes um, and what I'm seeing on the on the platforms definitely more women are doing it on their own taking it on uh sharing pictures it's it's been incredible so uh of course you are in a um a movable tent we are seeing more and more uh folks um using and maybe they've been around forever um the the, the more semi-permanent huts uh and of course the province has come out with uh some new um uh, I guess, rules surrounding um, these types of, uh, of, of structures, making sure that people register them and then be able to, to take them down at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the season. Has that been an issue uh, up in your neck of the woods? And, and what do you think of the new, the new rules? Well, um, we, we've had times where actually a couple of years ago, I actually phoned into Fish and Wildlife because it was already past the end of March. And there was a ice fishing hut that was left on the lake and um, no one was kind of claiming it. So, you know, I do think that it's important uh, that the registration program is there. Now, I'm not sure about everything I've read anyways. I'm not sure that you have to register anywhere. Um, what I have read is that you need to make sure you have your fishing shack or, or even your ice tent. If it's going to be on the lake longer than 24 hours, it needs to be marked. And so that means you need to have your name, your win number, and your phone number on a piece of paper marked on your ice fishing tent. I think it's great, even, even for, like, it's such a little community when you have a permanent um, structure. Other people come in and you, and you kind of develop this little community. And um, even if something were to go wrong in someone else's shack or I notice something's not quite right, I can walk over, grab his phone number, and give that person, he or she, a call and let her know if something's going on. So same thing um, with regards to making sure you mark your um, structures, your ice fishing structures, is that um, it is another way for fish and wildlife to be able to come in and notify that you need to remove it. So in our area, it is March 31st that the ice fishing shack needs to be off the ice. But I know in other areas in Alberta, it is March 15th. So um, again, you know, it's just an easy way to be able to um, identify whose ice fishing shack it actually is. And so I just do mine with a, um, put it in a Ziploc bag 
And I, what I like to do is I leave it inside my tent and I just kind of hit my wind number there, but anyways, phone number. And then I also like the fishing regulations on the back. So if anything happens and I'm, I'm, you know, can't remember, I don't have good Wi-Fi. I've got the book with me. So that's, that's not mandatory. That's just my little thing. And, and I guess we shouldn't, we shouldn't leave this conversation without talking a little bit about, about safety and, and determining ice thickness and, and that type of thing. Right. Absolutely. Um, safety is really, really important when you're out ice fishing. So, um, Prior to the beginning of the of the ice fishing season, if you're going to head out, you want to make sure you're pre-drilling your holes as you go. You want to start by walking out, eventually going up, you know, with a, a, a vehicle, um, ATV or, or something of that nature. And then again, as the ice thickens up, you want to go, you can then uh, move on with your vehicle. But you want to make sure that you're always drilling those holes to make sure you know what your ice thickness is. Um, the other thing I like with, or the other thing I use with ice fishing is I like to use my cleats because um, especially in a place like a tent where, uh, so last night we left the tents up and came in this morning and it was like a skating rink in here because, you know, the heat kind of warms everything, melts everything, and then it freezes overnight. So, you know, less chance of slipping, um, super important because you don't want to get hurt while you're out here. And uh, another thing, because I like to drill the live well, as I stated, um, you want to make sure that if you are going to pull your tent off, that you mark such a big hole because you don't want anybody else to fall in it or a vehicle um, to get damaged because of the, the large live well. So there's a couple tips. Outstanding. Well, listen, um, I know you and Mike have got a busy day to do some fishing, so we'll uh, we'll wrap this up. I want to thank both of you. Um, you. You went to great lengths. I mean, even to to light the tent. I really appreciate that. Uh, that was outstanding. And uh, Lisa, uh, continued success with uh, with your endeavors for connecting uh, women and the outdoors. It's it's great work that you're doing. Really appreciate it. And uh, continued success uh, with all your outdoor adventures and I look forward to doing another interview with you down the road that sounds wonderful Michael and thank you so much for having me and for inviting me on and of course for the very very kind words I uh I love what I do and I, I just hope other people are following along and enjoying it as well